Okay. Good morning, guys. Welcome back. Um, let's see. Just waiting for the stream to kind of establish. I'm not sure. Do you see a stream working? Not currently? Okay. Maybe it's coming in? Are you seeing me on the screen? Okay. What about the live chat? Yeah, it's working. Um, can you type a comment maybe just to yeah. see? Because for some reason, my live chat, I'm not seeing any comments, which is not ideal. But uh, hey, everybody. Sorry. Uh, it's just taking a second here to get things started. There's little technical issues. Now it looks like the stream is going, which is great. But unfortunately, I don't have a live chat function showing on my end, which is not perfect because I do want to hear you guys' comments and see them coming in. Um, hmm. Well, let me think. What's the best troubleshooting? Can you like uh, tell me the comments if they come in? Okay, so I just have a student in the class that will help me to um, navigate the, uh, the technical issues. So I'm going to keep this stream running. I don't want to take a chance on having to reestablish it and lose it. So we'll just continue with the stream as we have. The other one I started before I had to delete because it was not starting properly. This one's now functional, which is good, but uh, I can't see the live chat. Nonetheless, I do have a student here, so the student is going to relay me your comments when you do ask them, so uh, it's sort of like a team effort, I guess. All right, then, so um, welcome back, guys. Hope you all had a good weekend, um, and this week, we just have three meetings, obviously, where the first meeting today, we're going to finish off one more lecture on the question of life and death, and then... Um, you know what, maybe I have a, I might have a solution for the, uh, let's see here, for the live chat thingy, because I can run on my phone. Oh yeah, it's all good, okay, Not, you don't need to worry, because I, I do have a backup monitor on my cell phone, and that's showing the live chat, so just to show you guys that that's working. Okay, I typed in a comment, so now you can see that. All right, perfect, so back to work. Um, one more lecture, and we're going to finish strong. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the last couple of points that were in the article by Derek Parfit on what makes someone's life go best. So let me just go over that, and I'll summarize some of the information that led up to the end. Okay, so Derek Parfit, British philosopher of the 20th and 21st century, um, recently deceased, he wrote a paper in 1986 called What Makes Someone's Life Go Best? And... Um, we were just going through the main details of it. So he starts off by saying that to answer the question, what would make a person's life go best, you have to consider different theories of self-interest. And um, he mentions three possible theories of self-interest, right? So one of them, he said, was what he calls hedonistic theories. Hedonistic theories say that the blueprint for the best life is to just do whatever is going to make you feel the most happiness or pleasure. So whatever involves the experience of pleasure or happiness, you should do more of that. Um, he says the most plausible version of the hedonistic theories of self-interest are what he calls preference hedonism. In preference hedonism, whether uh, one out of two different options is more pleasurable for a person depends on which one that that person prefers. So, I mean, that's, I think, a common sense idea, but we cannot say in general what the more pleasurable action is if we're given a set of options. We have to know about an individual's preference, and that would set the ground for whether it is something that conduces to their happiness. Now, in the second uh, theory, there was theories of self-interest called desire fulfillment theories. In these, he said that m you would argue the best way to promote your self-interest is to fulfill your desires. Things that you want, go ahead and get them. And when you get them, that's a fulfilled desire. So the more of them that are fulfilled, the better and better a life goes. Um, a little different than the hedonistic theories because I guess you can fulfill desires even when you're not fully aware that they've been fulfilled. Like he gives the case of uh, a person that starts a business and passes away before it comes to fruition and makes a lot of money. That would be a fulfilled desire, but of course he's not alive so he can't experience the happiness. And so that's this experiential aspect versus just the fact that the desire has been fulfilled. That's kind of one distinction between those first two. But one thing they do have in common is that in each case, whether something's good for a person or improves their overall quality of life would depend on whether they desired it in the first place or whether they prefer it in terms of happiness. Now, the third theory of self-interest is the objective list theory. We'll say a little more about that when we get to it in a moment here. But this theory says that 
for your life to go well, you should just get the things that are objectively good for human beings to have. Um, that there are some things that are good for us and that there are some things that are bad for us, whether we like it or not, whether we agree or not. So this is saying that it's not about what you subjectively prefer or find pleasurable, but what's objectively good. So if we could list some kind of list of things that are somehow objectively good for people, the goal then would be to get all those things. So, I don't know, intelligence, morality, health, um, I don't know, some financial stability, um, moral goodness. Anyway, yeah, so get those things, and uh, whether you like to or not, that would be the best thing for you. So now, after that, there was some discussion of, <clears throat> let me see in my notes really quick. <clears throat> we talked about different types of pleasures or desires, um, the global and the local. Sorry, I just have to open my notes to the proper page. I spent some time earlier just getting the stream going, so that kind of kept me off my notes for a second. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> he says that the desire fulfillment theory is more plausible in what he calls the success version of it. He contrasts two different variants of the desire fulfillment theory. One he calls the unrestricted version, and he thinks that's a little too much. And then another one he thinks is correct, which is what he calls the success version. The unrestricted version of the theory says that all of your desires matter about whether your life is going well or how well it's going. So it places no restrictions anyway on what desires count. So if you have, um, he gets a case of like, you have a desire that someone recovers from a terminal illness or you know cancer, let's say, um, and if they do recover, the stranger that you're not so well acquainted with, he didn't really think that that enhances your quality of life or how well your life went. Because although it is a fulfilled desire, it's not a desire that's fulfilled about your own projects or your own goals. It's not like we would call it a success for you and that this other third party has recovered from their disease. So he thinks that the more plausible version of it is the success version, which limits the relevant desires to those that have some bearing on your own goals and projects. And then one more point that we were getting into as we stopped, and so this is, I guess, getting closer to a new material, was the difference between um, local and global desires. Local desires are desires for little particular things that you can satisfy it pretty much in the short term. Um, and then global desires are desires about uh, your whole life or about a large part of it. So think of if you have a desire to be um, well educated or to have a good career or to have a healthy, healthy family or to have good health. These are global desires because they're big picture things that take a long time or maybe even your whole life to stand up and maintain those things. Uh, but if you have a desire for, I don't know, a new shirt, um, you know, a video game console, uh, you know, like, a, I don't know, a travel opportunity or something, and then you do that, that's that's a local local desire. Those are things that can be satisfied in the immediate short term, and they're not like lifelong aspirations or goals. So anyway, then, he thinks that the global desires have greater weight, and he made the point that this is true by means of an example. He had a couple examples, and I think I ran out of time after just describing the first one. And these j examples were supposed to establish that the global desires have heavier weight, that they matter more in the estimation of how well a person's life is going, whether they're fulfilled or not. So one case was like, say, I would give you a drug that would make you a really heavy drug addict, but then I would also give you a lifetime supply of the drug so that you'd always be able to satisfy each desire each time it comes up. Would this make your life better? And he thinks to almost common sense, you'd say no, um, for the evident reason that although I'm giving you the ability to satisfy a lot of local desires, and there'll be a huge quantity of them, all of which will you'll have the means to fulfill, I'm setting back one of your global desires, which is to maintain good health and non-addiction. So that global desire is so heavy weight that um, frustrating its satisfaction matters more than having a greater realm of local desire satisfaction introduced by the drug addiction. And that pattern, he thinks, would be true of any either hypothetical or real example in which a person could opt for more of the short-term local desires but trade against some of their big picture global desires. Like if someone, I don't know, dropped out of school just to have a bunch of fun uh, for like a few months or something like that. Now, um, not to say school's not fun though. I don't know why people have this attitude about school, but anyway, I'm a professor, so you know, that's my essence, right? Anyway, um, now from there, there was one more example. I hope that, I think that example kind of makes his point well enough, but he has a second one. The second one's interesting too though, so I'll say it quick. He says, okay, now 
consider this. I'm going to give you two options um, again. Here's option number one. Okay, so in option number one, uh, let me think about how, which one to say first. Because <laughs> there's a long life option and there's like a shorter term. Well, it's not short, but it's not, not indefinite. So, okay, here's option number one. I'll give you, you can have 50 years of the highest quality life possible, like all of your global desires fully maxed out. So, I mean, just think of that, you know, healthy, wealthy, wise, massively successful, well-liked by everybody, um, I don't know, fully accomplished in terms of all of your goals, financially, personally, professionally, morally, you're respected. Okay, so we're talking about the highest level, you know, everything that you kind of want in life all your global desires fulfilled. But the, there's a, you know, the catch is that there's only 50 years in this one option. So after the 50 year period is over, you just drop dead, that's it, okay? So you got 50 years, but it's gonna be high level, amazing 50 years, all the global desires fulfilled. But then, okay, here's option two. Option two, I'll start off with the part of it that's uh, attractive, which is that it's not limited to 50 years. In fact, it's like almost infinite eternal life. It's indefinitely long. So you can keep going, going, going. But in option two, the problem is that you're going to kind of live the whole time in like a prison environment. Now, not like a brutal prison where you're going to be abused or harmed. You know, it'll be civilized and um, well-maintained and clean and everything. But the thing is, you know, living in prison, there's a lot of global desires that you would not be able to satisfy. Like you couldn't pursue your travel goals or your financial or professional or academic goals. You probably couldn't, of course, you know, have a family. Um, or establish like durable, lifelong, long-term relationships. So you got prison for as long as you want, but it's, you know, I guess a nice clean one. Or you have 50 years of this like fully maxed out, all your global desires fully satisfied. And so he says, which of those do you think is a better life option for you? You know, you got two choices and it was just forced choice scenario. What do you think would be your better life? I don't know if anybody has a view on this. You can say in the chat, which I can see. Uh, if you thought that one or the other was better, the 50 year or the unlimited life option, unlimited life in prison or 50 years um, at the absolute height of all global desires being satisfied. To me, uh, it's not as clear as he thinks, but I, but I think he has a very clear intuition and he thinks most people would be behind it. Um, and I kind of do agree, I guess, after some reflection. Um, but what do you think he's going for or, or what would your view be? Either way, like what's the author's conclusion or what is yours about the two choices here? Which one's the better life? Simple. Which one? 50-year thing with all the maximum global desires fulfilled? Or the other one that's indefinitely extensive, but, you know, you can't really satisfy all the global desires because you are in a prison. What do you think? 50 or, or just indefinite? Okay, so Grant, you're going with the 50-year option. Thanks for that. Um, and, you know, just spoiler alert. That is what the author thinks too. And so here's what he thinks this shows about his overall analysis, that the global desires do matter more because consider what happens in the other option where you got this open-ended span of time. You can satisfy some desires, like each day that you do something that you want to do at the prison, it's a little bit of a drop in the bucket of desire satisfaction, you know? So if you work out in the prison yard or you have a nice conversation with another inmate or you, I don't know, um, have an interesting meal at the lunch hour. Maybe those are things that you wanted and those are desires that are fulfilled. And I guess since this is an in indefinitely extensive time period, that if you draw it out long enough, thousand years, million years, that's a lot of numerically quantity wise, more desires that are satisfied. But qualitatively, the experience of the person's life seems to be relatively impoverished in comparison to the other person in the other alternative options. So, he says that if it was local desires that really were on an equal par, then people would have the other intuition. They would say, well, if I get more of the local desires and you give me enough time, that's going to be a better life. So he thinks this shows, again, that there's a quality versus quantity distinction here, that the global desires are so much better, that they're so much more important to us, that we would rather have a life which gave us a limited extension of time as long as we knew we could fulfill more of those since they're so much greater in value than the others. And uh, I don't know, maybe I can read from the book on that and see his words. He has said, um, <clears throat> yeah, if I make you an addict, I'll be increasing the sum total of your desire fulfillment. Um, 
but I'll also be giving you an indefinite series of strongly stream desires, each one, one each morning, all of which you can fulfill. Um, but by making you an addict, I'm not benefiting you. That's not plausible. Having the desires and having them fulfilled are neither pleasant nor painful. We need not be hedonists to believe more plausibly that it is in no way better for you to have and to fulfill this series of strong desires. And um, he says this, another case. Rather than describing another of the countless actual cases, I'll mention another imaginary one. Suppose that I could offer you either 50 years of life of extremely high quality or an indefinite number of years that are barely worth living. In the first alternative, my 50 years would, on any theory, go extremely well. I would be very happy, would achieve great things, do much good, and love and be loved by many people. In the second alternative, my life would always be, though not by much, worth living. There would be nothing bad about this life, and it would each day contain a few small pleasures. Now, if it just mattered how much you aggregate the local pleasures, and if the second life was long enough, it would be better for me. In each day within this life, I have some desires about my life that are fulfilled, but in the first, in the 50 years of the first alternative, there would be a great sum of local desire fulfillment, but it would be a finite sum. And in the end, it would be outweighed by the sum of desire fulfillment in the indefinitely long second alternative. The first alternative would be good. And the second alternative, since my life is worth living, e living each extra day is good for me. But I do not believe that the second alternative would give me a better life. And therefore, I reject those theories, which say we just aggregate the quantity of pleasures that are satisfied or desires that are satisfied to measure the quality of your life. Okay, so then here's the last point to, uh, to finish off Derek Parfit's work. You wonder, what's his view then about what is the best life, right? He's provided three theories, but he hasn't quite come down to say, and by the way, here is the one that I really do agree with. So now I'm going to tell you exactly what his own view is. Uh, his own view is an interesting hybrid between the desire fulfillment theories and the objective list theory. Okay, so let me kind of put some information about that here. <clears throat> so here's Parfit's view of the best life, the author. <clears throat> it is a combination. So it's not exactly just one or the other. It's a hybrid. It's a combination of the desire fulfillment and objective list theories. Sorry. Desire fulfillment. And objective list theories. Okay, and here's how the hybrid is uh, is described. Um, <clears throat> a person should, okay, make themselves desire the things that are objectively good. Just make that happen. Make it be the things that you want. For yourself. So a person should make themselves desire or want the, the things that are uh, objectively good, the things on the objective list, in other words. And then after that, after you've made these your desires, what do you think you'd have to do afterwards? Fulfill them and then fulfill them. Then he says you're getting the best of both worlds um, because you have fulfilled desires, but they're also objectively good desires to fulfill. And the way he looks at it, the two theories of self-interest by themselves, desire fulfillment versus objective list, he thinks they're each halfway correct, but they're missing something that the other type of theory offers. And that means that when they combine, they're, they're perfectly complementary. So let me try and explain why he thinks they're not fully satisfactory without an element from the other side. Okay, so <clears throat> say that a person is following the desire fulfillment theory by itself. What could be wrong with that? You know, what possible issue could you raise with a person who says, my plan, my mission in life is just to fulfill all my desires. Is there anything that could possibly be wrong with that or that could even be a little disturbing about that? What kind of issues, questions, problematic things could follow if a person says their only goal is to fulfill their desires? Can you think of something that might raise some concerns about this proposal? Say someone's wanting to fulfill their desires. What could go wrong? Can you tell me about that or what could be bad? 
about that. So it's a question. Let me see what you think. If you can give some type of answer here. <clears throat> Man wants to go fulfill his desires, or woman, whoever. What's wrong with that, or could be? Okay, there you go, Ellie. Very much so, yes. You say, what if the desires are not moral? Sure. Okay, so let me describe one pattern of life that some people, sadly, or tragically, I don't know what the right verb or adjective could be, but there's some people have lived this way, and it's not right. Are there ever any people out there whose main desire is to kill people, rape people, torture them? Sure, you know, there are people like that, and it's not good, but it happens, and it has happened. If you guys watch Netflix and stuff, I'm sure you've seen enough examples on, you know, different uh, entertainment viewing options. So, you know, sometimes people have bad desires that are evil, that are sadistic, that are immoral. Maybe somebody has a desire to exterminate a whole race, or maybe somebody has a desire to, like, you know, murder a series of people and uh, bury their bodies where no one will ever find them. Now, suppose that somebody does those things. They're fulfilling their desires, aren't they? Yes. It's not a good thing to do, but people do those things and say, yeah, that was a goal and I accomplished it. So do we want to credit such a person with living a good life just because from the point of view of what they wanted, they achieved desires that were fulfilled? Certainly not, but according to the desire fulfillment theory, all you can say is a good life is one where you fulfill whatever the desires happen to be. And so what Parfit finds fault with is that in some cases, people's desires will not be above board morally. People will have evil, heinous, sadistic, evil desires. And if they do, we shouldn't say that fulfilling them is a good way of living life. You know, I mean, like even Adolf Hitler, you could have said, fulfilled certain desires in his life. I mean, he became like a leader of a country and, you know, he had an ambition to exterminate a whole race of people and he did kill like 5 million Jewish people. But this is a horrible life, one of the worst of all history. He was never held accountable either, you know, he committed suicide. So he could have gone to his grave thinking, I did everything I wanted to do, but it's not a good life, right? So other examples could be given, but I'm just giving some very conspicuous, obvious cases. Um, I think serial killers and others that went without having ever been detected. I don't know, Zodiac killer, others come to mind. So, okay, problem. Desire fulfillment theory says go out and get the desires fulfilled. But what if they're bad? Okay, so that's an issue. On the other hand, let's look at the objective list theory. The objective list theory, we said, claims that you should get the things that are really good for people objectively, not just according to your own personal point of view. But what's really objectively good, that's the things that you should do in life whether it's good health, being moral, um, you know, I don't know, uh, <clears throat> being healthy, uh, moral, intelligent, <clears throat> having some kind of uh, success with a career or whatever. Now, those are objectively good things, let's suppose. And fulfilling them is what the objective list theory says is the best life you could live. But what could be wrong with that? Or what could be an issue with this? Say that somebody tells you, go ahead, fulfill all the things that are on the objective list. Is there anything about that that might seem to you to not really be the, the best life for a person? What could be the complaint, criticism, or whatever of that view? I'm trying to ask you to think of this question. What could be the logical, reasonable counter argument to the objective list theory, which says to get the things that are objectively good? So say that a person has got all those things. How could it be argued that maybe they still don't feel like they're living a great life? Can you think of this one? Say that I've gone to all the efforts to be moral, healthy, wise, um, and whatever other things, you know, I've cultivated my talents and stuff, things that are supposed to be objectively good for people to do. Is there any way that that could leave me still feeling like I don't have a great life? Maybe you can tell me why or why not. Because I'm trying to fish around for the point of criticism against the objective list theory. And then that'll help us to show why Derek Parfit wants to blend those two things together. So what's the drawback, if any, from objective list? Someone goes through life checking off items on a list uh, that are claimed as objectively good things. Is there any way that you can say maybe that's not going to be a satisfying life? How so? Just think about it and let me know in the chat. You seem to understand what could be a problem with the desire fulfillment theory. There could be bad desires. That's clear. Good. What could be a problem with an objective list theory? Okay, so now Sloan, good. You're saying this, just because they are objectively good doesn't mean that they are something that you particularly want to do. So you really wouldn't be uh, doing anything for your own pleasure. Very good. Yes. Ellie, a person might not want to do some of those things. Same. Okay, exactly. Good. 
That's right. That's what Derek Parfit also says. He says that in some cases, a person may feel like they're just going through the motions, right? Have you ever seen a person like that who says society or, I don't know, some standards that are out there kind of expect me to become this well-educated, moral, you know, family person that uh, is productive in the world. But maybe some people say that's not satisfying to me. My desires are not aligned with the things that are on the objective list. So while I'm doing it, I'm bored. You know, while I'm becoming intelligent, moral, uh, establishing this fantastic career, none of it is really fulfilling. So those are the two issues. On the desire fulfillment theory, a person could fulfill desires, but that they're bad. On the objective list theory, a person could get all these things, but not even care about them. So they wouldn't feel any kind of pleasure out of it. Therefore, what does Parfit say we have to do? Merge these things together, marry these two theories as one, because they supplement each other in a way. And this is the way of bringing them to, into uh, one piece. He says, make the desires that you have coincide with the items that are on the objective list. So what that means is, if you're sitting back and you're like, I don't know if I care so much about being intelligent or moral or healthy. I know people say it's good, but it's not necessarily something I like. Then this Derek Parfit would be telling you, fix yourself, change yourself, get yourself right. You know, get yourself to like the things and want the things that are objectively good. If you don't yet, something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's something wrong with you if you don't want them. If you don't want to be healthy, moral, or wise, why not? Something's wrong. Those are objectively good. So start liking and wanting those things. And now that you want them, go ahead, focus on achieving those things. And now that you got them, you have the best of both worlds because you have desires that you have fulfilled, and they also happen to be of objectively good things. And so in this way, we get the best of both worlds. You fulfill your desires, but you're also fulfilling desires that are like righteous and good and that are not like deviant or immoral. And in that case, uh, you get the best aspects of both worlds. You're getting fulfilled desires, but they're objectively good too. So he thinks that's the right blueprint for the best life. And I'll read then the end where he says this, and you can see it from him. So at the end of this paper, he says, which of these different theories should we accept? Um. <clears throat> He says, some hedonists have reached their view as follows. They consider an opposing view, such as that which claims that what is good for someone is to have knowledge, to be rational, to be aware of true beauty. Hedonists ask, would those states of mind be good if they brought no enjoyment and if the person in that state of mind did not have the slightest desire for it? Since they answer no, they conclude that the value of these states of mind lies in their being desired and in their arousing a desire for them to continue. The reasoning assumes that the value of a whole is just the sum of the value of its parts. And if we remove the, bar, the part to which the hedonist appeals, what is left seems to have no value. Hence, hedonism is the truth. Suppose instead more plausibly that the value of a whole may not be mere, the mere sum of the value of its parts. We might then claim that what is best for people is a composite, a combination. It is not just being uh, in the conscious state you want to be in, nor is it just having knowledge, engaging in reason, being aware of true beauty and the like. What is good for someone is neither just what hedonists say, nor just what is claimed by the objective list theory. We might believe that if we had either of these without the other, what we had would have little or no value. We could claim, for example, that what is good or bad for someone is to have knowledge, to be engaged in reason, to experience love, to be aware of beauty, while wanting those things. And so on this view, each side is only half true. Each put forward a sufficient condition uh, each put forward as a sufficient condition something that was only a necessary condition. Pleasure with many other kinds of object has no value. And if they are entirely devoid of pleasure, then there is no value in knowledge, reason, love, or the awareness of beauty. What is of value, or is good, is to have both. To be engaged in these activities and to be wanting strongly to be so engaged. So you got to get your mind right so that you want the things that are objectively good. And then once you have set these as your goals, the pursuit and the fulfillment of them is simultaneously fulfilling to you from the point of view of desire and objectively good on a level of morality, beauty, and reason. So that would be the way of doing it, according to him. But unsupplemented, each one is lacking a piece. If you just fulfill desires, who's to say they're going to be good in the end? And if you're just getting things that are good, who's to say that you really want them in the end? So you've got to try your best anyway to set your desires to align with the objective list. How does one do that? It's a little tricky, right? Famously, it's said that you can't really control what you desire. Like I tell you right now to just start desiring anchovy pizza, even though you probably don't yet. It's not so easy sometimes to set the bounds of what you do desire. But knowing that something's objectively good perhaps can provide a condition where you can 
um, incline yourself towards desiring it. So anyway, that's the final couple of words about the Derek Parfit. And now I can clear the board of that. And there was just one more author and essay that I said we would try to speak about if we had time today. We do have a little extra time. So I'll try to say at least a couple things about this author and the last essay is Death by Thomas Nagel. <clears throat> Okay, so Death by Thomas Nagel. Um, Nagel is a American philosopher born in 1937. Um, and I believe he's still at New York University, which is like the elite institution in the United States for philosophy. I mean, there's a couple of big ones, obviously, but that's widely known as one of the major centers of philosophy research and uh, study. But anyway, Nagel, born in 1937. So... This paper was first published in 1970, and as you can see, it's just called that. <clears throat> okay, so in this paper, the author wants to just consider a straightforward question. Is death bad? Is death bad? Yes or no? And um, he knows that there are different views about the question. Some people will say, oh yeah, obviously it's bad. It's the worst thing. Are you kidding? What could be worse than that? Other people, though, say that... Um, well, if you think about it in the proper way, it's not really bad because assuming that a person no longer exists after death, then there's nothing there to be experienced as like a negative or a loss or, you know, some kind of uncomfortable situation. Um, so he's going to try and consider both views. But in the end, his own uh, conclusion is that, yes, death is bad. And um, the reason that he's going to say so is that it's because it would deprive us of the goods of life. Not because of what it is like, because it would be a state of non-existence, so it wouldn't be anything. But it would be bad, as you could say, because it deprives one of the continued enjoyment of the goods of life. And that's what constitutes its so-called uh, badness. I'm just opening my notes. Sorry for that. It takes a second. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, sure. sorry, here we go. Thank you. Um, all right, so death. <clears throat> it's a true and disturbing fact that everybody dies and that everything has a finite limit. In philosophy, among all the other deep questions that we ask, we ask, how should we confront this? Is it something to be feared, and is it generally a bad thing? Or are those common attitudes, in fact, based on a false idea of its significance? Um, Thomas Nagel, American philosopher, takes the negative view that it is a bad thing but he seeks to give that a philosophical foundation. He wants to justify that, not just off of an intuitive feeling, but on a logical argument. Um, and so his goal is to analyze the question and to explain why death does seem justifiably so bad to us. Um, so he begins with a simple question. Suppose death is the end. If it was, would it be a bad thing to die? Now, I know many and maybe even most believe in the afterlife, and I certainly have no disagreement with that. But the author, anyway, is just asking a question from a standpoint of like um, a logical analysis. We're being asked to do the following. Just suppose for the sake of argument, whether you actually believe this or not, but suppose just for the sake of argument that death was really the final end of your consciousness. So it would be like the annihilation of consciousness with no future revival of consciousness in some type of afterlife or whatever spirit world. Suppose that then death really was a total final end to your consciousness, if that was true, if it was, hypothetically, would that be a bad thing? So when he talks about whether death is bad or not, he's speaking about it in a defined sense, in a stipulated sense. We're not asking, would death be a bad thing if assuming, you know, you'd continue to live in heaven or something, but whether death would be a bad thing if, suppose, it really was the end. Now, people don't all agree on the question. Some say, of course, it would be bad because you'd be gone and there'd be nothing left. So you'd lose everything literally. And what else could be worse than that? But other people say, um, no, because the loss of life deprives the loss of any subject. Uh, so there's no longer a person who's there to experience the so-called loss. And therefore, whatever bad features it may have can't be experienced by the individual. So how can that be a bad thing? But um, he's going to, again, try to side with the more negative side of it, that it is bad. And he'll try and explain why he thinks this. So anyway, keep in mind that he's only assuming for the sake of discussion that death 
is defined in the sense of permanent death of the consciousness with no survival. He's not saying that's true. How could we prove it? He's simply attempting to learn about the concept. And this is an important question to ask, even if you're fully convinced of the afterlife, right? Because even if you are a believer in the afterlife, I would assume that if you believe in it, you think it's a good thing that it exists. But if you think it's a good thing, then that can only be a judgment that you form by contrast to the thought of how bad it would be if that wasn't true. Okay, so it's a question, even if it's purely theoretical, that does have interest. Because if you value the afterlife as a concept, then you should be able to ask yourself, why do I think that's such an important thing? It's because you don't like the idea of death being the end of your consciousness. So he makes a claim. He says, if death is bad, it's not because of what it's like. According to the sense described here, it wouldn't be like anything. But rather, it would simply be because of what it deprives us of. And so I'll write the comment here. This is like the core point of his whole essay. So Nagel says to you this, death is bad in the sense described as, you know, final death. Death in that sense is bad because it deprives a person of continued experience of the goods of life. It removes the goods of life. The goods of life is what death takes away according to this depiction of death as the final end. And that's why he says we fear it, why we have legitimate reason to fear it and to dread it, um, because it does bring to an end all the goods of life. Now, what are the goods of life? The goods of life are supposed to be things that are very basic aspects of being a living thing that we enjoy and that we want to continue. Okay, so if I ask you what are some of the very basic goods of life, what do you think you could say? And these have to be things that are timeless and universal. So you can't say like having computers or having a car because those are things that only matter or can even talk. You can only talk about them for like the past 150 years or so. So these have to be things that are just in the human condition, just being a living thing. What are some of the good things about that? Anybody have some thoughts? Um, I mean, I can put some of them out there, but they're quite obvious, I think, and they're intimately, uh, you're intimately aware of all of them as a, as a living thing. So goods of life. Think of, for example, example given, just um, even being able to perceive anything. Uh, well, Drew, you say love, sure, and I can say like certain types of um, relationships that you want to continue to enjoy and experience. So that's a good point, Drew. I was mentioning even more fundamentally though, like, right, look, you can open your eyes and just see stuff, right? You have perception of anything. So perception, the five senses, right? Sight, taste, touch, hearing, and smell. Since you're alive, you have the five senses and you can perceive. And um, aside from perception, how about just like thought, being able to think of anything right now? If you're thinking of what you're going to do later today or you're thinking about, you know, your weekend, whether you're having memories or imagining the future, you have conscious activity, you have mental activity. That's a baseline fact about being alive, and I'm sure you want that to continue. Um, desire, things that you want, and then getting those things. That's a big part of life and being a, a living conscious being. We could even just say activity. And I know activity is a little bit general, like what activity? Are we talking about sports or you know, playing video games or doing, you know, I don't know, public speaking or something? Well, all of those things, just activity of any kind you know, across the board, couldn't do that, of course, if you're dead. So these are the things, basic goods of life that are provided for by being alive. And if you weren't alive, if death was really the destruction of your consciousness forever, then you couldn't have any further relationships, perceive anything, think about anything, have any desires, or even take any activity, whether it was physical or mental. And so those things are desired. These goods of life are desired, even though sometimes, of course, they don't bring pleasure in every single case. Have you ever had an activity that you did that you got injured doing it or, you know, um, you had like a disturbing thought that you didn't really want to have and you couldn't get it out of your mind? Sometimes the things we think can make us upset or sometimes the activities that we do or the relationships that we find ourselves in can bring about disappointment and loss. But that does not mean usually that we say, well, I'm done with all these things. I'd rather not have any experiences uh, except for, of course, people who become so suicidally depressed. But for most all, we want our basic goods of life to persist, even if and when they occasionally lead us into a not-so-ideal outcome. 
And so the fact that we're attached to these goods of life, and we would hope in theory that they could just continue on indefinitely, that's why he says death in the sense mentioned in the essay would be a bad thing. Because it's good just to be living. It's good just to have these goods of life, even when we're not in perfect circumstances. So since we want those things to indefinitely continue, and since death would annihilate and cause them to cease, that's what represents the bad thing about death, the deprivation and loss of the continued enjoyment of the goods of life. Um, he also makes a quick point at this, at this level of the essay to say that when he speaks on death, he really wants you to understand that defined in his essay anyway, it's like permanent loss of consciousness, not temporary. You've heard perhaps of some people that say, oh, wow, you know, I got in this accident and I literally, I was dead for like five minutes, flatline. And then they, you know, resuscitated me using like, what are those things, the uh, defibrillators um, or the injection of like adrenaline into the heart that somehow jump starts it and gets it working again. But he says, that's not the kind of death we're talking about here. So that would be like temporary interruption of consciousness followed by reestablishment of the same consciousness. So when he speaks of death, he means, you know, the permanent uh, destruction of consciousness. If there ever was the ability to like revive people in a cryogenic chamber, you know, some very wealthy people will have their bodies frozen uh, at these sub-zero temperatures, hoping for future technology to be able to discover a way to revive um, biological matter that's become like non-functioning. If that was possibly real, which I don't think the scientific prospects are very good, but if it even was possible, that still wouldn't fall within the definition of death as he's giving it here. Because remember, he's saying of death, we're looking at it just from the standpoint of permanent destruction of consciousness, not temporary. So anyway, um, in life, what's good about living is the states that we can find ourselves in, the conditions that we can find ourselves in, and the types of activities that we can do. So if death is so bad, he thinks the really bad thing about it is the loss of all the goods of life, not the state of death itself, which doesn't have any kind of qualitative experiential nature, since it would be just a blank. Um, so it deprives one of the continued enjoyment of the goods of life. Now, he knows that there are some people um, who would not agree with him, and he tries to consider a few objections, just as most philosophers do. He takes on some objections to his claim that death is a bad thing because it deprives you of the goods of life. So there's these three possible objections, and I can put those here and try to explain how he replies to those. <clears throat> Okay, so one objection was, how can something be bad for somebody without it being unpleasant to them? Without being unpleasant to them. Because in the description of death he gives, it's not that it's some painful or unpleasant state, it's just non-existence. So how can that be bad if you're not even able to experience it or to find it um, unpleasant? Like what you don't know can't hurt you kind of thought. So if a person's not there, then they're not, you would assume, bothered by their own non-existence. That's one objection. Another objection, which is related to the first, is when or how do you assign the misfortune? Um, Okay, when do you assign the misfortune? Famously, in ancient Greek philosophy, they talked about this point, that while you're alive, death isn't there by definition. So you don't experience it while you're alive. And then if you're dead, you aren't there to experience anything. So it's like death is never experienced. While you're alive, it's not happening. And after when it does happen, you're not there to experience it. So it seems like you can't experience the misfortune while living, and a dead person can't experience any type of anything. So it seems like when could this misfortune really be happening? Um, or experience. And then the third objection would be the question, why why should there be different attitudes towards non-existence after death as opposed to non-existence prior to birth? You ever think of that? So why different attitudes to non-existence after life, or death rather, Why different attitudes to non-existence after death versus prior to birth or 
conception, maybe I should say, but let's do that. Okay. So in the third objection, the question is this, like, why is everyone so scared and freaked out about not existing someday in the future after they're gone? Because already you didn't exist for like billions of years before you were born and nobody seems to care about that. Like nobody says, ooh, it gives me the creeps, it gives me chills thinking about 1950 when I didn't even not exist. Nobody bothers, that doesn't bother anybody. But when you talk about like 2150 and not existing then, that might make you bother because it's like anticipating future non-existence. But somebody might argue the attitude should be on a par. So if it doesn't bother you that you didn't exist before, why would it bother you that you won't exist later? Okay, well, he has replies to all the different objections that you're seeing there. And um, I'll try to just say a quick couple of words about his responses. He says, in terms of the first one, like what you don't know can't hurt you. He says, well, think about it like this. If a person like a smart adult got into a terrible accident today and suffered like a traumatic brain injury that levels their intelligence back down to the level of an infant or a toddler. So now they got to be cared for by everybody. They have to be fed, changed and they no longer have like um, higher level functioning of the mind or the brain. So now it's back to pre-linguistic, like the mental status of an infant child. But the person, let's suppose, because of the injury, doesn't remember anything. And so they don't remember their previous like adult able uh, functioning level. So they're actually just as content as a baby if the baby was being well cared for by its parents. So now look, he says, according to somebody who thinks something's bad if it can't bother you, we would say this person really has not suffered a misfortune because although they took on this terrible injury, they don't seem to care much because they don't really have the awareness of it. But he says, looking at it objectively, but from our standpoint, we could say that was a misfortune because of the basic simple fact that they have lost cognitive functioning, even though they're not aware of the loss. So in the same sense, he says, the fact that a person is no longer exists because they have died means, yeah, they can't experience the loss. And so they don't know about it or they're not like, you know, thinking about it, obviously. But it would still be something bad for them on a par with the person who suffered this brain injury because that individual has been deprived of something that they had before, even if they're not aware of it. If you compare the brain injured adult to an actual infant, they're in the same cognitive state. But we pity the adult and not the infant because if we compare the current state of the adult to their prior state, we can see a loss. We don't see any such loss when we compare the prior state of the infant to its current state because it's just developing towards full um, mental capacity. So this is something that he calls the historical account of misfortune. And I think that's the last thing I have time to say. But the historical account of misfortune says that some unfortunate things can only be seen as such by comparing someone's prior state to their current state. And if we do that with our brain injured fellow, then we will see that his prior state was a higher level of function than what he's at now. And that's the misfortune, even if he's not aware of that. In the same way, if one dies by comparing the fact that they were alive out there enjoying all the goods of life, and now no longer alive, that is by itself the misfortune, despite the fact perhaps that someone cannot be aware of it. When I talk about the historical account of misfortune, I always try to mention that the end state cannot be claimed as good or bad without reference to the past. If I say someone has a million dollars in their bank account on December 31st this year, I ask you, is that a good fortune or a misfortune? And you really can't say unless you knew what they were like on January 1st. If they had a dollar to start the year, then this is rags to riches. If they had a billion dollars at the start of the year, then this is 99% of their wealth has been lost. And so the same dollar figure of a million can be a fortune or a misfortune, depending on what we would compare it with in the past. So the state of non-existence after your life can be seen as a misfortune because if we compare it to having lived, it's a loss. The non-existence prior to your conception, prior to your birth, can't be compared with anything because there was no person before that. So that's why you not existing in 1950, he says, does not bother you. But you not existing someday in the future does because that's something we can compare with the existence you have now. Whereas not having existed before your parents ever met. There's nothing to compare that against in terms of a prior existence state. So in the end, long story short, he says this is the reason that he thinks death is a bad thing because it deprives you of the goods of life. So we need to hope for an afterlife then because if not, according to this author, it's something not so nice in store for all everyone. But anyway, guys, that's it. Um, thank you so much for all your patience and hard work through the semester. I appreciate it. But we'll be doing our uh, review sessions Wednesday and Friday. So come back, make sure to attend and participate. And then we'll be as prepared as we can be for the upcoming final exam. 
So uh, thanks, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. If you need anything, as usual, just email me, and I'll be in touch. Okay, then. Have a good one, and uh, let's see you say goodbye, and then I'll close the stream <clears throat> while I'm putting away my markers. Thanks, Sloan, Ryan, everybody that's here. We're all good, right? Just let me know in the chat because I don't like to close it too fast. Okay, perfect. Thanks again, and have a nice one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <clears throat>